What is going on, Ape Nation? I've said it before. I'll say it again. Anytime Gary Gensler opens his mouth, it's time to pay attention. This is why I bring you part four of Gary Gensler's testimony in front of Congress. So it's now time to pay attention and watch the video, and we're going to get right into it. But before we do, I do ask that you'll smash that like button for me as it helps get this out to as many apes as possible. And also, if you're new here, make sure you subscribe because uh, I drop content just like this every single day. Are you familiar with Rule 17J1 under the Investment Company Act of 1940, <clears throat> excuse me, and Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934? Um, yes, generally, sir, yes. <laughs> yeah, just uh, for others, edification, uh, 17J1 under the Investment Company Act of 1940 and Section 10B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 are the two provisions used by the SEC <clears throat> combined with judicial president to prosecute individuals for the practice of front running. This prohibition on front running includes any efforts to do so, including via information obtained through payment for order flow. Um, so is the practice of front running already illegal? Um, the practice of front running is uh, against met the rules that you said, but also the exchanges, a number of the exchanges, self-regulated organizations have that. And it's really to protect the public that if I put an order in that uh, I can get uh, that, that inside the market and somebody's not gonna take that and use it in front of me. Um, I know that you've been critical of uh, payment for water flow, contending that it presents conflicts, <clears throat> excuse me, of interest for broker dealers and that retail customers are harmed through inferior execution quality. Uh, do you still stand by that? I think that we need to take a look at this whole market structure because many orders are not competing with other orders. If you placed an order to an exchange, uh, uh, with a broker, I'm sorry, if you placed an order, it might be bought by one uh, party and has, has been publicly disclosed. There's one wholesaler that has 50% of the market share in the retail market. And so it's really about are the orders competing with other orders. So I'm pro-competition and I'm not sure that this payment for order flow system really is the best competitive landscape. Is it accurate to say there's another safeguard designed into the system, uh, this one by retail brokers, to cure potential conflicts of interest for payment for order flow arrangements from all of their execution partners? <clears throat> Uh, in other words, this means that the execution partners will pay the same rate and act within the same system, essentially putting all execution partners in competition with one another, <clears throat> excuse me, on ex execution quality and not payment for water flow. So I, I think the challenge is, is if, if, if a party is buying all the order flow for, or, or, or bulk of the order flow, then the order by order competition doesn't exist. So the retail public doesn't benefit from that competition. That like, when I was growing up, you had competition. It wasn't uh, it, the modern technology, but it was competition on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and brokers could scream and yell at each other about what they were gonna pay. Um, now, if one party is buying literally half the retail flow in America, these market orders, that's, that could actually have diminished competition in the marketplace. Do you think the retail brokers should route the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, route orders to the market center where they have the highest likelihood of obtaining the most favorable execution for their customers? Um, uh, why or why not? I, I've asked staff to consider the economic analysis and really think about the whole market structure. How can we lower the cost of capital formation and raise the returns for the retail public and the institutional public? And, and we've not updated in 16 years that national market structure. So I think it's really a, it's almost like a sweater where everything's knitted together. And, and I, I, I was quoted recently about if something was on the table, I said yes, because I think in this, in this area, kind of it's all on the table to think about the rebates at the exchanges, what's called the tick size, uh, the national best bid, best offer, all with one goal, competition in the marketplace to lower the, the, the cost and raise the efficiency. That helps capital formation, it helps investors. Thank you, I'll probably add a, a couple of questions for the record to expand on that, but thank you for your answers. Um, I want to talk a little bit for in my remaining time about the gamification of retail investing. Um, how would you describe gamification? 
it's a term that I must admit I'd only heard in the last year or so, but if I can broaden it out, it's, it's encouraging. And, and do you think government should prevent gamification? Uh, I think I think the role of the SEC is about protecting investors. So I think the question is, are there are there conflicts that arise by doing behavioral prompts to encourage Senator Lummis to trade and sending Senator Lummis a different prompt than Senator uh, Warner or Warren? And they've they've sort of differentially marketed to the three. Senator if, Warner's. Not if we here. go down that path, I want to be respectful of time. But right. if we go down that path in states like mine that have an education lottery, I think in Maryland you have a similar lottery. If we go down that path and we look at possible restrictions or uh, eliminating gamification in the investment sector, why wouldn't we apply that same logic to lottery systems across the nation or any uh, publicly gamified uh, ventures? I, I, I think what, what I'm interested in learning, and we just put out a public comment, a request for comment, not even a rule, to ask, uh, could you help us, the public, comment on if a platform is maximizing to revenues by marketing to each of these senators in this room differently, could there be a conflict rather than considering what's best for each of you as in your families for your investment needs? And so it's that these, these platforms are now uh, optimizing uh, based upon our Fitbit, based upon our uh, mobile apps based upon how we drive our cars. They're, they're maximizing based upon all this data. And that brings us greater innovation. It's, it's, it's a plus to innovation, a plus to access. It can be a plus to lower cost. What we're just raising is it could it be a conflict as well if they're trying to uh, market to everybody differently. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Tillis. Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair Gensler, good to see you. As we all know, the asset management and investment consultant industries are overwhelmingly white and male. We also know that study after study has shown that greater diversity leads to greater profitability. So in an effort to improve performance in these industries and thereby benefit everyday investors, uh, the SEC's Asset Management Advisory Committee unanimously recommended that the SEC take several tangible, concrete actions to improve diversity in the industry in a way that is aligned with the SEC's own diversity and inclusion goals and its mandate to protect investors and promote fair and open markets. Have you had the opportunity to re read the full advisory committee's report? Uh, I, I, sir, I'm familiar with the report. I've read a summary to be okay. candid with you. Uh, have you been briefed by the authors of the recommendations and the advisory committee's diversity and inclusion and subcommittee leadership? I've, I've met with the leadership of the committee. Uh huh. Have they advised you about it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, well, uh, these recommendations, they're simple, they're straightforward. Uh, for example, one is to require enhanced disclosure requirements on gender and racial diversity of advisory firms. Some firms already report this information voluntarily. And others to establish a procedure to allow the SEC, when it receives reports of discriminatory practices, to direct reporting parties to the government agency best equipped to investigate the complaint. None of this is particularly difficult or controversial as is evidenced by the unanimous vote of the advisory committee. So given that broad support, can you commit to bringing these items before the commission for a vote before the end of the year so we can bring transparency and diversity to the industry and ultimately deliver better market outcomes for investors? I, I've asked staff to uh, look very closely, not only at these recommendations, but other recommendations with regard to issuers, but you're speaking about on the investment management side and make recommendations up to the commission. Um, uh, with a full docket, I don't want to um, uh, say what time that will be. It might uh, be let after, me just say after you, the end of this let year. Let me just say you've be been around ended. here for a while, and I get similar answers from every chair, and the problem is we never end up with any concrete steps to creating the diversity that everybody claims that they support. So I'm tired of hearing about we're going to study it, we're going to get more recommendations. I want to know what is our pathway to action. So, um, sir, we're doing more than just studying. I've asked uh, staff for recommendations on the issuer side, as we've talked about earlier, about human capital, and that's the 7,000-plus issuers, and that includes diversity, uh, includes uh, uh, workforce statistics, as uh, 
uh, uh, Senator Warner and I were discussing as earlier as well, and, and Chair Brown. So um, I've asked to uh, bring that up in front of the five-member commission. It's a lot to take on to, to do the economic analysis, and it'd be very investor-focused because we have to live within the chalk lines. This is this is about investors and what investors make their decisions upon. Well, uh, we'll be following up with you. Uh, this, this is an issue I've been pursuing for some time and without satisfaction, to be honest with you. Um, should shareholders of companies that make public pledges expect their company to act in a manner consistent with the state of company policy? I think it's at the bedrock of our uh, uh, securities laws. Uh, um, uh, President Roosevelt called the first act in front of Congress, the 33 Act, the truth and securities law. And so you're talking about that if you make a pledge to your shareholders about building a factory or any pledge, that you not defraud the public, that it be be uh, honest rendition and and of, of the uh, disclosures you're making. Well, after the insurrection attempt earlier this year, many companies made public pledges to stop donating money to the 147 members of Congress who objected to Congress's certification of President Biden's victory. However, since then, many of these companies resumed their political donations in direct contradiction to their public pledges. So I don't believe necessarily that, that they follow what they say. So therefore, do shareholders have the right to know whether their company's political donations contradict their public commitment and whether those companies may be supporting outcomes which might pose a material risk to the company's bottom line? Um, if it poses, as you say, a material risk and, and there's been a, a, a a material misstatement to the public, that's that's at the center of our securities laws. Well, I look forward to seeing some enforcement in that. Finally, uh, due to public health concerns, in November of 2020, FINRA provided member firms the option to complete branch office inspections remotely for can calendar years 2020 and 2021. Um, what's your assessment of the quality of those remote inspections? Do you think regulators sacrifice any oversight by allowing these remote inspections and uh, because we're still facing with the delta variant pretty high uh, is the sec considering extending remote expansion inspections uh, given the pu current public health uh, well senator we are i mean we as a nation are living through the most challenging time uh well at least in my life uh, uh uh, health-wise and economically related to that. Uh, when I have conversations with our head of examinations, we have about a 13, 1200 person examination unit. I ask that very question, what do we, what do we lose? What do we gain being remote? And um, uh, there are trade-offs. Uh, we've gained, uh, people aren't commuting as much. They're, 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 the people have a better work-life balance and so forth, our examiners. What we lose is you're not sitting in a room eyeball to eyeball talking to somebody as you're trying to inspect a fund or uh, uh, a company and so forth. Um, but yes, we're looking at uh, extending uh, this be just because of the health, the realities of this health uh, pandemic that we're in.